Center for Tourette Syndrome and its associated disorder, is, and its directors and employees assume no responsibility for the accuracy, completeness, objectivity, or usefulness of the information presented on our site. We do not endorse any recommendation or opinion made by any member physician, nor do we advocate for any treatment. You are responsible for your own medical decisions. I am now going to turn over the introductions of our speaker to Martha Butterfield, the program coordinator of NJCTS. Marty? Thank you, Kelly. And I want to welcome everyone to tonight's webinar. Our speaker this evening is Leslie Geyer, a certified licensed occupational therapist with over 30 years experience. She has received advanced training in the assessment and treatment of individuals with sensory processing disorder. She is the clinical consultant for pediatric therapeutic services in Conshohocken, Pennsylvania, and is certified to administer and interpret the sensory integration and praxis test. Leslie is also the parent of an adult son with Tourette syndrome. It's with great pleasure that I turn tonight's presentation over to Leslie. Thank you, Marty. Well, as those of you who have Tourette syndrome or are living with someone with Tourette syndrome know, um, the presence of or the coexistence of difficulty with sensory processing and integration is very common for individuals with Tourette syndrome. Um, it probably has something to, it's somehow related to the fact that Tourette syndrome is a condition that's um, characterized by sensory urges to do certain movements or make certain sounds. Um, when, while I'm presenting, I'll probably be referring a lot to children because my work is with children, but the principles and interventions that I'll be talking about can easily be carried over to um, work with older individuals, with adults, older um, teens, and I'm happy to address any questions you have related to that. So we'll get um, like to start out talking about the sensory system. Um, we all are familiar with our basic five senses, visual, auditory, olfactory or smell, and oral or gustatory and taste, and then the tactile system. But we do have three other systems that are less well known. There's the interoceptive system, which is basically from internally generated um, sensations, things like hunger, nausea, headache that come from our internal organs. And then there's our vestibular sense, which is our movement sense, and our proprioceptive sense, which is our sense of body position in space. And those last two are very important when we're talking about sensory processing and sensory integration particularly with regard to intervention. So I really, I'm going to take some time to talk about what those look like and how they operate. The vestibular system has receptors mainly in the inner ear. It tells us about um, how our body is moving, where we are in relation to the ground, and it has a strong impact on balance and eye movements. Um, the vestibular system is the reason we feel off balance and dizzy after intense movement. Um, it also is um, related, it, it relates to um, the eyes in that if, if we're spinning for a period of time, our eyes will move afterwards. Um, it, so there is a, a direct correlation to eye movement. The proprioceptive system um, tells us about joint bending and straightening, pulling apart of the joint, the bones of the joint, and compression or pushing together of the um, muscles or the bones of the joint. We have receptors for this system in our muscles and our joints. Um, it tells us where our body parts are and what they're doing in relation to earth or gravity, so how they're moving in relation to gravity. Um, a good example of how this system works is if you were to close your eyes and I were to tell you to touch your nose, you would probably be able to do that with very good accuracy, and that's because your body has a proprioceptive sense. It has a, a memory and you have sensation from your um, joints and muscles that tell you, you know, how to do that movement. 
Um, these are very, very, again, important senses in terms of modulating um, our responses to um, sensory input. And we'll get into that in a little bit. When I talk about sensory processing and integration, what am I talking about? Well, this is the way the nervous system receives messages from the different senses of our body, our, our sensory organs, and then processes and integrates the information in the brain in order to make appropriate motor and behavioral responses. When we talk about sensory integration therapy, this is, this is different than, um, and, and, than sensory processing. It's basically a frame of reference that's used by therapists to treat individuals who are having difficulty with sensory processing and sensory integration. It was developed by a therapist by the name of Jean Ayers. She's an occupational therapist. Um, began to develop this theory and this approach in the 1950s and 60s. Um, Jean has since passed away, but the theory is still evolving, and there are many um, therapists and other neuroscientists um, doing a lot of research on the, the approach. So it's still a, 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 you know, an evolving approach, an evolving frame of reference um, that's being researched. The focus from, with sensory integration is on using purposeful activity and promoting what, what's called an adaptive response. And this is a purposeful, goal-directed response to a sensory experience. Um, usually, it's a novel response, something that's just a bit challenging for the person. And it, classically, sensory integration therapy occurs in a sensory-rich environment and I'll, we'll talk a little bit later about what that looks about, and it's provided in the context of play. So it's classically done with children. Not to say that some of the techniques will not work with adults. When, um, why do we talk about, why do we refer to this as difficulty processing? processing and integrating sensory information versus giving the disorder a name. Well, at this time, there's no real mass of research that supports naming the condition as a separate disorder. So leaders in the field are currently recommending that we describe the problem instead. So um, that's why I, I refer to it as the problem, again, as rather than a condition um, with a name. You may have heard in the past of conditions such as sensory processing disorder or dysfunction, or um, sensory integrative disorder or dysfunction. But again, the you know those who are leaders in the field doing research are advocating at this time that we don't use those specific name disorders because of the lack of research to prove that they exist on their own. So what do these problems look like? What does difficulty with this processing integration look like? Well, first we can see modulation difficulties, which are over or under responsiveness to sensory input. So basically this has to do with the level of sensitivity to sensory input in a given sensory system. And it might be high or low or in a more average range. We also can see difficulty with discrimination of different types of sensory input. And then the final classification would be um, motor problems. We often see an effect on balance and posture and the ability to create motor plans and carry these out. And that can be a direct um, relation or a direct response to a problem with sensory processing or integration. So we'll first talk about the um, modulation difficulties, that first category I talked about where that has to do with the level of response. We'll see children who have sensory over-responsiveness. Um, and this is very, probably the most typical response we'll see with, um, with individuals with Tourette's syndrome. They will tend to avoid certain types of sensory input. Not all sensory input, but, you know, certain types through certain systems. Um, they may show very negative responses to specific sensory input. Often it's tactile input or certain types of touch. Um, tags in clothing will bother them. Certain textures will bother them. 
all, the other commonly seen system where we'll see problems with this is through the um, auditory system. So certain sounds will be very difficult to tolerate. Um, one boy I know who has Tourette syndrome will actually you know, put his hands over his ears with, with common sounds that we all deal with in our environment. And, and he'll say, it hurts. It hurts my ears. Um, often people who are over-responsive are very cautious and don't like to take risks or try new things because those things can be challenging to their sensory system. Um, they may actually, we may see a fear of movement or heights if their um, vestibular system is involved. Um, sometimes they're picky eaters or very sensitive to smells. You probably know people who can't tolerate being around someone who's wearing perfume because they have a hypersensitive um, olfactory system. Um, individuals, children particularly, who have this over-responsiveness will often melt down in loud or busy environments. Um, I, I, I like to tell the story of the time my son was seven and we took him to the Wildwood Boardwalk and he had an all-out meltdown. He just could not handle. It was a hot night, so there was the heat, the temperature to deal with, and all of the visual stimulation of the rides and the people and then the sound. Um, so that, you know, that was a perfect example of how um, a, a child with Tourette who had some over-responsiveness in some of his systems um, just really couldn't handle a very stimulating environment. And again, it's important to remember that this can affect one system or multiple systems. You might have um, a child who only presents with this, the tactile responses, where they only show negative responses to certain touch or tactile input, but really you don't see that with any of their other systems. Or you might have a child who, you know, presents with this with multiple systems. Um, and then on the other extreme, there are individuals who are under-responsive. Um, they tend to be very passive and have a low arousal level and appear, often appear lethargic. They don't have a lot of response to sensory input and things that are going on around them. Um, also under this category, they, you may see children or individuals who show need for more sensory input than their peers. And they, we call these sensory seekers. They tend to seek out more information, more input in order to keep their system around. So they're actually what they're doing is trying to compensate for the fact that they have this under-responsive system. Um, they may, may um, you know, touch things too much, show this need to kind of touch everything they can get their hands on, um, may have, you know, uh, need for just excessive stimulation to keep themselves alert. Um, and uh, again, it's all not uncommon to see individuals who over-respond in one system and under-respond with regard to another sensory system. Um, very commonly we'll see the over-responsiveness or the hypersensitivity to um, touch and sound, but then see this kind of seeking or excessive need for um, maybe um, things like movement and input to the proprioceptive system. So these sensory seeking children uh, that we talked about often appear hyperactive and they have a very high arousal level. They may be unaware of touch or pain. As I said, they have a need to do too, touch too much. Um, often they'll take part in unsafe activities um, and enjoy sounds and other sensory input that are basically too loud, too bright, just a little bit too intense for most people. Um, they, children with this type of sensory processing, sensory integrated problem may appear hyperactive. So there, we, you know, as therapists, we'll want to tease out what could be actual hyperactivity and atten attention related and what's more sensory related. And then the next class of um, problems that we talked about are children who have more of a problem with discrimination. Um, these children will show a decreased ability to 
interpret and organize different types of sensory input. They may have trouble distinguishing one sensory experience from another. They might have the inability to um, tell you if, they're, if you occlude their vision and touch them with a sharp object versus a dull object, they would have may have difficulty telling you which was which. Um, often we'll see problems with visual discrimination and visual perception problems. Um, we may see problems with auditory discrimination, which makes learning very challenging. Um, often, too, they'll have poor proprioceptive body sense, so they won't have a good feel for where their body parts are in space, and this can make motor activities very difficult. Um, can also make it difficult for them to judge how much force they're using. Um, I, my own son has a lot of problems with um, awareness of his proprioceptive sense, and you know, and when he was younger, he would constantly be breaking pencil points and had a lot of trouble with writing because he couldn't regulate the amount of pressure he was using. Um, he would often would, you know, when he'd go to hug someone, he'd hug too hard. He just tended to use a lot of force with everything. It was great for baseball. He was a great hitter, had a lot of home runs, was a real good batter, but uh, could make a lot of problems with other things because he just, it was kind of an all or nothing in terms of the force he used with body movement. And then we have the final category we talked about, the children who have sensory-based motor problems. And again, keep in mind, it wouldn't be uncommon to see a child with those more modulation problems where they ha are over or under responsive to sensory input and also have these um, sensory-based motor problems and may have some discrimination problems too. It's very common to see a combination. So the children who have these sensory-based motor problems tend to have problems with balance and sequencing or, or planning a, a succession of movements. They have difficulty imitating movements from others. They very often will show a preference for very um, familiar or sedentary activities. You know, when you give them toys, they'll try, tend to line things up rather than playing more creatively. They may also have trouble using both sides of their body together, such as they would need to do to unscrew the top on a jar, where one hand is holding the jar and the other hand is working the lid. Um, also often have trouble cross crossing the midline of the body with their hands. By this, I mean if you were to draw a line, um, cutting your body in half, starting at your head and moving down to your toes, this is what I'm referring to as your body midline. And often children with these type of problems cannot take easily take one hand and cross it over that body midline to the other side of the body. So this is something we'll look for as we're assessing them. Um, and as a result of all of these problems, we often see poor gross and fine motor skills. By gross motor, I mean things like running and skipping and hopping fine motor skills being more what things they would do with their hands and more um, fine skills that way. So how do we detect these, these problems? Um, typically, it's an occupational therapist who's doing the assessment. Um, we will sometimes, use, well, often use standardized tests. Um, the most well-known is the sensory integration and praxis test. I don't recommend this for a lot of children. It has a very narrow age range, and it also takes four to five hours to administer. It, it's with very rigorous procedures. It's really a grueling test to administer. It's a grueling test for the child to perform. So, And I find there are other ways that we can gain the information in a more functional manner. Um, there's also no specific subtests that specifically look at the modulation problems, which are so common with individuals with Tourette syndrome. Um, there are also a number of questionnaire type tools that are standardized, and these are actually what I prefer. Um, we'll use we'll we'll use these questionnaires with caregivers and teachers, and also perform other interviews that give us a lot of information about the child's 
and then we'll observe the child during play and other daily activities that are appearing problematic. And then what we'll do is we'll um, work carefully with the family and teachers, as we're often working in school, to help them understand the impact of the child's sensory differences on function and behavior. So, um, you know, help them to understand that that child who's constantly seeking sensory input is going to have a really hard time quieting down and going to bed at night, which we know is a very, very common problem for children with Tourette syndrome. Um, we'll recommend certain environmental modifications and accommodations. So, um, you know, we may recommend that um, a classroom teacher turn off the overhead fluorescent lights when possible, maybe set up lamps in the classroom. Um, sometimes children are hypersensitive to things that are as minimal as the, the flicker of the bulbs in fluorescent lights or the, the, the buzzing noise that they make. Things that most of us aren't even aware of can be completely irritating and distracting to a person who has a hypersensitive system. Um, so we want to make, you know, make recommendations that are going to make the environment more tolerable for the child. Um, and then we want to work directly with the child. Um, we'll sometimes do work, do something like called providing sensory stories. We'll develop a story for the child about a situation that's particularly difficult for him or her due to the sensory problems. We'll then have the child um, talk through with us how they react in that situation typically and things they might do or strategies they might use to help them cope better. So if going into the cafeteria is particularly difficult, um, which it is for many children who are hypersensitive to noise, um, we'll, you know, we'll talk about what it feels like to go into the cafeteria, what, how they typically react, and what kinds of things they might do to help their, their system not be so hypersensitive and to react in a more um, effective way, whether that be wearing headphones and, you know, taking in a, 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 a CD player or something like that, or, or doing some things before they go to the cafeteria to help prepare their system. Um, other times we'll use graded activities that help them to improve their response to sensory input or improve their discrimination abilities or their motor skills. There's some basic things that will help a lot um, and tend to help children with various different types of sensory processing problems. Heavy work activities are really good and really important, and the reason is that they give intense input to the proprioceptive system. The proprioceptive system, I think, is probably the most important system in terms of intervention with um, an individual who has problems with sensory processing and integration. Input to this system tends to be organizing, um, no matter what, you know, whether the individual is hypersensitive or hyposensitive. So we'll want to give lots of activities for things like pushing and pulling and lifting and carrying, um, opportunities for activities that give high impact to the muscles and joints, like running and jumping and hopping and skipping. Um, in addition to that, deep pressure touch is another thing that's very organizing to our sensory system. And it's not unusual to hear families of children who have extreme um, sensory processing difficulties tell you, tell a therapist, my child will actually crawl under their mattress and lie between the mattress and the box spring to get this heavy pressure input. Um, so they're, you know, they're actually telling us they need this, this input. Both the heavy work activities and input to the proprioceptive system and the deep pressure touch input have been shown to increase serotonin levels. We know that this is something individuals with Tourette syndrome typically need. So it, it is interesting how they kind of all, um, you know, kind of play together. Children um, or individuals who have sensory processing integration difficulties 
need lots of time for movement activities throughout the day. The worst thing when we can ask them to do is sit for long periods of time, as they often have to do in school. Um, not to be forgotten is oral input. We have lots and lots of muscles and sensory receptors around the mouth and in the face, and these are very important to focus on. So things like chewing and um, chewing on chewy or crunchy foods are going to give a lot of proprioceptive input to those muscles in the face and mouth area. Um, and, and can be very helpful. I, one of the simplest things that a person with um, sensory problems can do is carry a water bottle around, the one that has a stuck top, and use that to get input to that oral system. So, and more specifically, for the child who has um, over-responsiveness to sensory input, what we want to do is calm the sensory system or decrease the arousal level because these children tend to be over aroused. So we'll want to use things like deep breathing, um, low rhythmic movement or rocking. Uh, again, deep pressure touch is more calming versus light pressure touch. And um, often we, if the child has tactile hypersensitivity, want to be very careful about touching them unexpectedly because that can actually be very painful to them. And these children who have this will often get into trouble when other children at school touch them accidentally. You may see you know, an explosive response to that because it is such an uncomfortable experience for them. Um, slow rhythmic music is helpful too using low and natural lighting um, as a get opposed to fluorescent lighting, and keeping in mind how visual input in the environment is impacting the child, in, particularly in the classroom. We want to keep that organized and to a minimum if possible, and giving lots of opportunity for these children to get proprioceptive input. We need to anticipate that children with this type of problem are going to be prone to meltdowns from their um, hyper or over-responsiveness. Um, I, I typically counsel parents, you know, uh, rethink that trip to Disney World if you have a child like this, because the, the amount of stimulation in a place like that may really be too much for a child who's over-responsive, and they may benefit from a vacation in a, a calmer, quieter environment after learning this from the Wildwood Boardwalk. Um, and uh, other things that can help, we, um, oh, simple things like Under Armour clothing, um, the clothing that people often wear for exercise or athletic activities is very stretchy and tight-fitting. Some individuals who need a lot of that deep pressure input will, will report that that um, is beneficial to them and that feels good to them. So others don't tolerate it. It's kind of a, a you know something you have to try um, and see if it works. But it, I have had a lot of children who have over responsiveness say that it actually feels good to them and it helps them. And it's it's a, a you know an easy kind of normal appearing thing that they can use. Um, these children often need a quiet environment or kind of an escape place, a safe place they can go to to get away for sensory from you know, excessive stimulation. The children who are under-responsive are kind of the other end. We're trying to awaken or increase their arousal level. So we'll use fast and disjointed movement, rotational movement, um, particularly during our therapy sessions. We'll try to provide that music that has a more irregular beat is helpful. Um, light touch activities versus the deep pressure touch is usually more helpful. Use lots of visual input. Again, they need lots of opportunity for movement and change of position to keep their arousal level up and keep that from dropping. Um, foods with strong flavors and intense aromas can help to wake up the system for children who have this problem. Often it's helpful for children who are under-responsive um, to spend time in their classrooms in standing rather than sitting at the desk. We see that if they're sitting for long periods of time, we'll gradually see them start to 
slump over and collapse into their desktop. So if they're standing, it tends to keep their system more aroused. Then uh, for children who are sensory seeking, we want to allow them lots of time for active play in a safe environment. Keep in mind, these children are, are prone to accidents. I have one. <laughs> yeah, I think I tell him he has a bed in the ER named after him. I mean, we've had so many trips to the emergency room because of his sensory seeking behavior and his engaging in unsafe activities because of that. Um, lots of movement opportunities are really important. For kids who are sensory seeking and having trouble um, sitting in class, sometimes fidget toys that they can have in their desk, something they can be doing with their hands so that they're you know, not getting into trouble but for keeping occupied can be really helpful. Um, therapists will often put the soft part of a Velcro strip under the desk so the child has something to, you know, to touch, to feel, to use to get sensory input at, while they're you know, remaining seated. Very important for lots of oral input for these type of children. Um, another strategy that we use that helps in classrooms and can help at home too with homework is we'll take a piece of stretchy exercise band and tie it around the legs, the front two legs of the chair, and then the child can you know, kick at that, kick backward at that, and bounce their, their legs off of that and get some input to the proprioceptive system um, and without being disruptive to the rest of the class. And again, just can't emphasize enough, these kids need lots of deep pressure and heavy work activities, particularly before they need, they're expected to sit quietly. Um, I, my son used to, he had a really hard time in fourth grade. He had a, this was when his Tourette's, his Tourette's symptoms were at their worst. Um, he had a teacher, uh, a young male teacher who, wonderful of him, had, had the kids out of their chairs a lot, which as a therapist I completely appreciate. And, you know, again, I think it's a wonderful thing. But he'd have the kids out of their chairs doing some sort of a math game where they were um, doing wastebasket basketball. And then all of a sudden he'd go, okay, now we're going to sit down and open our book. Well, that may have worked well for 90, 99% of the kids in the class, but my son would still be bouncing off the wall before he had to, you know, when everyone else had to sit down and sit quietly. So he really needed some of those more calming, organizing activities during that transition from, um, you know, from a, a, a more excitatory activity to a, a quiet activity. Um, bedtime for these children can be particularly difficult because um, the children, you know, will have trouble, again, calming down and, and um, transitioning to a more quiet activity. These are ball chairs. They can be really helpful for kids with sensory processing and integration problems for use in school because they allow for a little bit of movement input while the child's expected to be seated. Inflated cushions that can work the same way. The child sits on these on their chair and again it can give some movement. Children with discrimination problems, we want to use games and activities that require them to um, identify objects with touch without using sight. We do a lot of visual perceptual work for the children who are having more problems with this with their visual system. Um, we'll use feedback in games use where the child has to use different grades of four. So we might be doing an activity where the child has to color one part of the picture very lightly and make the, the coloring very light. And then another, they have to use a lot of force to make their coloring dark and make them aware of you know, using different levels of body force, um, different body awareness games, body movement games. And for the children who have difficulty with auditory processing, FM systems are often helpful for use at school, um, where the teacher wears a microphone, the child has a receiver, and it helps to eliminate extraneous noise that children with processing problems in the auditory system will have a lot of difficulty with. These are some activities for children with sensory-based movement problems. 
we'll want to provide a lot of activities that challenge balance. And I'm not going to go through all these, but you can see some of them listed. Um, you know, a lot of play that requires um, standing on one leg and, and things that are really going to, again, challenge their balance, sitting on an exercise ball, sitting in different um, positions like squatting can be really helpful. I also want to provide activities that, uh, that demand motor planning or coming up with a motor idea in their head, planning the movements and carrying it out. Children with these motor problems often have a lot of difficulty using playground equipment. So we'll want to, um, you know, practice with them on playground equipment. Have talk through the tasks. Um, things like ball play are very good, where they have to make a, a very quick movement and have to, you know, kind of a very rapid planning sequence. Um, we want to use a lot of novel motor activities that encourage the child to make those adaptive responses we talked about with the sensory integration therapy. Um, children, I, I have a good um, example of a child with real significant motor planning problems I saw a few years ago. With, I was out um, supervising a therapist, and we were in a, um, a little therapy room that had a suspended hammock neck swing. And the child came in. He was seven or eight. And I said to him, let's get in the swing and swing. Well, this child could not even begin to figure out how to move his body so that he could sit in the swing. And I had to talk him through each, you know, step of the, the movement he needed to do to get there. That would be typical for a child with this type of problem. Again, um, we talked about the problems with bilateral coordination, problems using two hands together for activities. So we'll want to use a lot of activities that require using two hands together. Um, first, starting simple, where the two hands are doing the same thing, and then working to tasks that require hands to do different things, like cutting with scissors, where one hand has to hold and the other hand manipulates the scissors. It sounds simple, but it can be extremely difficult for children with these type of bilateral coordination problems. We'll also see that Clapping and tapping and rhythm activities are very difficult for these children. So we'll want to use a lot of those. Um, equipment you might see in a classic sensory integration therapy clinic. A lot of um, suspension equipment, equipment that provides intense movement. But we can um, have, have, you know, have ability to provide the same kind of input at home and school through more commonly available um, materials or, or activities, like as we talked about, lifting, pushing, pulling, um, different types of equipment that provide movement activities or movement experiences that are more commonly available. And again, so we really want to look for opportunities for proprioceptive input, such as playground equipment. Um, a final word about a program that we often use with these children, it's called the ALERT program. Some of you may have children who are getting therapy and are using that in school. Um, we also call it How Does Your Engine Run? And basically what it does is it help, it's a program that was developed by a couple occupational therapists that helps the child become more aware of their own level of arousal in a given situation and then teaches them things that they can do to change their level of arousal and bring it to a more normal level at a given time. Very good for children who have under arousal or for those who are sensory seeking. And then here's a, a couple good references or resources for you. I know this my PowerPoint slides will be posted on the website so you can access them in the future. And I guess now we can move on to questions. Okay, Leslie, thank you. Really a lot of great information. And we also have a really long list of questions. So okay. I'm going to start right into those, OK? Mm -hmm. um, and I apologize a little bit. Sometimes this may have been something you covered, and I might not have caught it in the process. So um, okay. I have a question about whether or not a child would grow out of these sensory problems. Well, that's a good question. Often they do. Um, and I did. I saw that with my own son. His 
his sensory processing issues are much less than they were as a young child. So often, at just as many individuals with Tourette tend to, tend to see a decrease in their tics as they get older, yes, we'd see a decrease in some of these sensory systems and a better ability to cope with sensory demand. OK. Um, I have a question about interventions for older teens. Mm -hmm. Can these um, OT interventions help with older teens, or is it kind of too late at this point to make much of a difference? Very, particularly um, with the modulation problems where we have under or over responsiveness. And again, if, if you, I always feel like I'm saying to families and therapists, go back and think about the proprioceptive system and deep pressure input. You know, so I mean, I have adults who come to my support group meetings who say, you know, I can't stand touch. I, I, certain things, crowds just make me crazy. So before they, they go into an environment that they know is going to be difficult for them to tolerate, they'll want to do something that gives some heavy input to the proprioceptive in, in, um, system or some give themselves some deep pressure input. You know, and it can be as simple as going and doing some wall push-ups. You know, those are the kinds of things we teach children to do in class. Do seat push-ups where they put their hands down on their chair and push their butt up off their seat. You know, and that's giving a lot of proprioceptive input. So it's a matter of learning what helps, what calms the system, and then knowing when to use it. Okay, I want to just touch on that that deep pressure a little bit further. So def define that a little bit more clearly for me. Okay, so um, deep pressure touch like you get when someone gives you a, a real tight hug. That's okay. giving deep pressure to your um, touch or your tactile system versus a light, light touch where someone lightly touches you with their fingers. And that deep pressure touch is very calming to um, a, a person who has a hypersensitive system. And that's why that Under Armour clothing I talked about is often helpful because it provides that deep pressure touch. If you're wearing an Under Armour shirt, you're getting deep pressure touch to your, your trunk, your arms, and that can be calming. So it would seem then that massage therapy would be helpful in, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. in and I often instances. Um, but for children who have trouble quieting down for bedtime that parents do, you know, to set the lights low, put on some um, nature sounds or classical music and, and do some massage with their child, giving that deep pressure touch and it often works very well. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, let, let me just uh, flip to the head of the list here. I have a question, and I don't know. I don't want to come at, uh, to you out of left field, so I'm not sure if, if you can answer this or not. But I had a question about self-hypnosis therapy. There's been a lot of that in the press recently. Is that anything that you are familiar with and could discuss? Um, I don't know that there have been any studies relating it to sensory processing and sensory integration, though. I have seen, recently seen the study on that, and it makes total sense to me because if you've ever done self-hypnosis, it's very relaxing, very calming, and it, it would definitely help most individuals with their responses to sensory input. So I can definitely see where it would be beneficial. All right, thank you. I um, have a question about patterning as a, as it was. Was patterning a program developed to treat sensory problems? Are you familiar with patterning? I am. Um, and I, what I'm familiar with is more um, use of it to treat children with cerebral palsy. Back in the 60s, 70s, um, I'm not so familiar with it to treat sensory processing problems. OK, thank you. Again, I didn't want to come out of left field on that, but it was kind of an, an odd question. Question on the all right, could a child with TS, and you probably addressed and touched on this a little bit too, be both over and under responsive depending on the situation or the day? Yes, and that's what makes it so hard to understand because 
you know, the responses do vary. Yes, there might be one day where the child, um, or one situation where the child seems very hypersensitive or hyper responsive to um, sounds and noises. And then another, um, you know, the next day in a different situation, they seem oblivious to that. So yes, that isn't uncommon at all. We can see differences within a given sensory system from day to day or time to time. So often there is a more consistent pattern. Well, you know, it's interesting because we had another question as it related to just that part of it having to do with, you know, suggestions for dealing with teachers and administrators, you know, when they feel that what they're looking at is behavior. And, and that happens a lot, obviously, with kids with, with TS that may not have sensory issues. Mm -hmm. But it does create a problem when there's, when there's um, inconsistency to, or appears inconsistent exactly. to someone on the, looking at it from the outside. Mm -hmm. And, that's and any suggestions along those lines for teachers and, and faculty who just, yeah. you know, just don't get it? Lots of education, lots of, you know, explaining to them how the sensory system works, how these inconsistent responses are not atypical, um, and just lots of education. But yeah, I, I see those, you know, responses on a daily basis. <laughs> okay. Um, it seems like there's a connection in, to this parent with children with autism. Is there, is there a connection beyond the fact that TS, for example, would be considered, you know, sort of a spectrum disorder? Is, that, is there a connection beyond that in terms of the sensory issues and autism? Um, well, I think there's a connection. There could be a connection in that sensory issues are very common with Tourette syndrome, and they're very, very common with autism. There have been lots of studies that link sensory processing and integration difficulties with autism. I have yet to, seen one, to see one of those studies on Tourette syndrome, though those of us who know Tourette syndrome well know for sure it's there. So yeah, that would be the connection I would see. OK. Um, there's a question about um, a child who plays soccer. And, and at times, he seems confused with the action on the field. Mm -hmm. And would you think that this was because of processing problems or sensory issues or both? I think it's very likely due to, and again, often processing problems are sensory related. But yes, I think that's very likely. And it could be an auditory processing problem where, you know, the, all the, the stimulation of all the sounds and, and all the movement of the other players combined with that is, is really too much to handle. And again, sometimes a, a break, if the child can come off the field for a little bit, do something that provides um, some of that deep pressure touch deep pre um, and intense proprioceptive input will help to organize enough so the child can get back in the game and be successful. All right, so maybe a timeout that actually is very specific for that child. That's for someone to work with them, you know, on the sidelines. OK. Mm -hmm. um, the techniques that you've talked about in terms of sensory processing and so forth, would, would, would you think that they would be helpful to reduce motor tics? Yes, because we know that motor tics increase during times of stress. So the techniques we're going to use are going to help decrease stress and stressful responses to sensory input. So yes, stressful sensory situations, are, we're going to see tics get worse during those situations. OK. Um, what kinds of tactics would you recommend for a child who is very sensitive to taste and smell? Um, again, lots of deep pressure, touch, um, proprioceptive input before meals, before times where the child's going to be exposed for that. Um, children who are, are picky eaters and have limited, um, you know, tolerance to different types of foods, are, they are really challenging. I know that's a difficult, um, you know, it's a difficult problem to address, but again, I'd, I'd kind of go at it slowly, try to gradually increase the repertoire of foods that they they will tolerate, um, you know, maybe, you know, ask them to have 
you know, one bite of that, that food that they don't prefer, and then they go back to, you know, finishing up with their preferred food. Okay, but it really is a, a, a slow process then is, is what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. I've worked okay. with a lot of children with those with autism with those types of problems and it is really, really challenging. I mean if if it become it comes to a point where growth and, you know, overall nutrition is a concern, it really needs to be brought to the attention of the medical doctor. Okay. Um, what is the incidence of um, sensory issues with a diagnosis of TS, and and it's kind of a two-part thing. Um, and and would you tend to witness, or could you be likely to witness these sensory issues before the TS symptoms appear? That's a really good question. There, I'm not aware of any studies that show, um, you know, what the percent of incidence of um, sensory processing problems are with Tourette syndrome. I do know that there, there have been studies that show that it's about one in six for the general population. To have a sensory processing integration problem, that's significant enough to affect daily activity. I suspect, I would say my, my experience is that it's much higher than one in six with individuals with Tourette syndrome and of the parents of children and adults that I work with or I've talked to, I'd say very rare that there isn't some, at least one aspect of, you know, sensory processing that's problematic with the individual with Tourette's syndrome. Um, what okay. was the part of uh, Yeah, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that to you. Let me find the other question. And are you likely to witness sensory issues before TS issues? Uh, uh, yeah. Symptoms? I think that's very probable. We'll often hear, um, and too, with like aut the autism spectrum, we'll hear parents say, you know, as a, as even as a newborn, I couldn't, he wouldn't cuddle, I couldn't hold him. And then that child will, you know, later show more signs of an autism spectrum disorder. I think that's very likely. And if I look back at my own son, then, you know, he was, um, he, when, when he'd get hungry, he, you know, he wouldn't get fussy he would all out shriek and to the point that I had babysitters who wouldn't care for him because they just say, I can't stand it. You know, so his response to hunger was so intense. It was so painful to him. And, and, you know, at home we learned to anticipate it and never get him to a point where he felt really, really hungry. hungry. Yeah. yeah. But, yes, so, I, that's, that's a good question, and I think it's very probable you could see those sensory issues before you saw the tick? Well, I've met your son, and I have trouble quite imagining him getting frantic like that. But um, <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> yeah, my son, kid. Yeah. I'm fortunate that my son has really outgrown a lot of his ticks and Tourette symptoms over the years. He's 20, almost 21 now and uh, really doing very well. But, you know, the early years were really challenging for him. I'm so sure. I do want to offer that, you know, kind of ray of hope for those of you who have younger children that you really can see some significant changes. Um, someone has suggested a book, and I'm just going to pass this along and ask if you're familiar with it. Um, it's for adults with sensory issues. It's, apparently the title is Too Loud, Too Bright, Too Fast, Too Tight. It's excellent. It's a great book for understanding what children who have that hypersensitivity are going through, or or adults. Um, but I would I would recommend it for parents of children with that as well as adults. But yeah, it's it's a well known book and it is very good. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, let me see. My child has TS and ADD as well as sensory issues. He can never remember the strategies he learned in OT. Um, couldn't remember to look at the note card reminders or the note in, in his notebook. Uh, do you have any suggestions around that? And, until those things become more automatic, he's going to need a lot of help from adults. So he'll need prompting from his teacher. You know, the, they can't expect that child to 
remember to look at the card or do the strategy on his own. The teacher's going to need to recognize the need to use that strategy and cue him. Um, you know, okay, you should, it's time to do some chair push-ups. And actually, some of my son's best teachers were able to identify my son's need for those kind of activities and give the whole class a break to do those kinds of things. So the whole mm -hmm. class would get up and take a quick movement break and shake out their arms and legs. And it's beneficial to all children, but it's particularly needed by the, our children. So again, yeah, I, I've had that suggestion before, too. And it, it's really about why single the kid out? Just everybody get up and march around the room or whatever you need to do, especially in the lower grade. We, and they all get a chance to stretch. and, and yeah. And they all need it. I mean, the number of children we're seeing being referred to occupational therapists in schools is just outrageous. And, and um, t these are often kids with no other diagnosed disabilities, no other, no problem. It's just they can't sit still. We are expecting kids to sit way too long, way too much during the day. All right. Um, I don't want to come out of left field with a medication question. So if you don't want to field this, um, you, can, um, you can say so. I have a question about, are there any medications that have been beneficial for sensory difficulties? I don't know that there are any specific studies that relate use of medications to, um, you know, to sensory processing problems. I guess the fact that, if you look at the fact that proprioceptive and deep pressure input have been shown to increase serotonin levels. Maybe the SSRIs might have some impact on helping sensory processing issues, but I certainly wouldn't want to, um, you know, recommend that a, a, a parent go out and, and, you know, try to push to have that communication for their ch child with yeah. sensory Un processing. Understood. Yep. Um, any strategies for a child who screams very loud just to get the input? Um, a, a quiet place where they can go to do that, and also if if nothing else works, and that you know that's just really really a need. Um, lots of oral sensory input. So seeing if chewing gum helps to limit the um, times that the child needs to do that, or chewing hard, on hard objects, does that give enough input to the muscles of the mouth and face and that it helps to limit that? Those would be the first things I would try. OK. Um, could these sensory problems lead to a need to go to the bathroom, often feeling the need to urinate? Um, it, there could be a hypersensitivity, and actually, <laughs> My son would probably be mortified if I shared this, but when he was younger, I, I often wonder if that was related to his OCD. But, you know, no sooner would we get in the car, he had to go, you know. And uh, I don't know if it was, uh, you know, related to his anxiety and, and worry that he wasn't going to have enough time or if it was a sensory issue. But sometimes that, you know, we will hear that there are actual um, related problems with more interoceptive senses that we talked about, those senses that come from, um, you know, um, the internal organs. So it could be a hypersensitivity, yeah. OK. Um, had, uh, uh, let's see, my TS child struggles with speaking too loud. Is this related to his TS? And if so, what, what can we do to help him realize this and control it? Um, so I won't answer that for you, but it sounds more sensory than TS. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it does sound like it could be a sensory issue, and he's not discriminating loud sounds from not so loud sounds or more normal, you know, um, volume. And um, it, it could be very helpful to work with him on, you know, practicing. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna speak really soft, or we're gonna whisper, and now we're gonna get a little louder. And now we're going to get to a little more loud. And oh, gee, that's a good level, almost like um, a sensory story. Um, you know, this is a good level to talk to people. And then, OK, we can go louder. Oh, that hurts my ears. That's really too loud. You know, so a lot of practice with 
speaking um, at different volumes and giving feedback on what's a comfortable level for other people and what is not. That's not a real common problem I hear of, but that, as a therapist, that's how I would address mm -hmm. it. So, so the child that's speaking loud doesn't necessarily know that they are. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Is that what, so that's, that's the issue. So they, they don't know that they are, and they just can't regulate their sound. Right. They're, they're not discriminating enough. They're not discriminating um, that it's, the sound is too loud. Okay. Like my, child, my son had a discrimination problem with um, touch and temperature. He would come out of the shower and his skin would be bright red because he, the water would be so hot. And he didn't notice it. He couldn't detect that that water was too hot the way most of us would. Well, this child isn't detecting that the sound is too loud. Hmm. OK. Um, all right, I have a question about a 16-year-old. Um, having problems with organizing input from teachers, um, from teachers to what is important and what is not. He's been checked for auditory auditory processing and is OK. Is mm -hmm. there a sensory processor that would be related? Um, so is there a, it, so I'm probably asking that badly. Yeah, not that I could identify with that information. My first thought would be, is there an auditory processing problem? And if that's been ruled out, um, it could be a problem with executive function or attention. Yeah, that's what I was thinking when, mm -hmm. as you were talking, that it was more of a, an executive function issue than a um, than a sensory one. Mm -hmm. Which okay. is probably a good topic for another webinar. <laughs> Actually, you are right, and we're uh, we're going to have one of those. <laughs> good. <laughs> um, we're talking a question about clothing here. Clothing mm -hmm. she's worn before, what doesn't feel good. We change several times before we find items that feel right. Um, something that felt right one day won't feel good the next. Um, so, and then it starts up with a, it, it's relating now to a problem in school because she doesn't, she keeps changing her clothes and is late for school and can't, mm -hmm. you know, any suggestions in that? Um, maybe before getting dressed in the morning, some deep pressure, touch, and proprioceptive activities might help to, tol to increase tolerance to the feel of the clothing. Th those clothing issues can be really difficult. I, you know, I, I have talked to families who've experienced that. I mean, there are kids who insist on going to school in shorts in the dead of winter because they can't stand the feel of pants on their legs. And it, it can be really challenging. But I but, and oh, sorry. go back to that proprioceptive input, deep pressure touch. So given that it's it's hard to tell one day to the next, then laying out the clothes and trying them on the night before doesn't necessarily solve the problem then. Not really. The, the, the parent's probably going to see certain clothing that feels better than others, and I certainly try to steer towards that as I'm shopping. And often it's like sweatpants and and sweatshirts that are very soft inside. Sometimes, again, it's much lighter clothing. Some kids can't even tolerate the weight of more heavy clothing on their body. And they've got, you know, they live in t-shirts and, and very light clothing. OK. Um, we're almost out of time. I'm going to probably pick two more questions, and then, um, and then we'll wrap it up, OK? I have a question about. Um, from a therapist, actually, who deals, who treats eating disorders. Mm -hmm. And there's a history of eating disorder in a family, but this five-year-old child will only consume liquids. Um, would you, do you have any comment about that in terms of differential diagnosis or treatment options? I have worked with children like that with, um, with on the autism spectrum. Um, I, I do a thorough assessment of sensory problems and address the sensory problems, but I also tend to find that, particularly by age five, there's a very intense behavioral component, too. 
and like to see those children referred to a, a hospital-based feeding program. I know Children's Hospital of Philadelphia has one. Um, AI DuPont has one. Hershey Medical Center has a very good program. Um, and I would want the child referred to those programs because there are such significant um, nutrition, you know, effects and impact from, from a selectivity like that. And they are very, very difficult to address. All right, thank you. Um, sure. I've got, I'm going to do one more question, but any of you, I know we've run a little over, that want to leave early, just please, if you're going to do that, be sure you answer the, uh, the survey that pops up when you um, end your webinar participation. And the last question, what part does um, motor planning and sensory processing play in learning disabilities, if, if any? Well, actually, the research that Jean Ayers first began in the 60s, um, 50s and 60s, was, was specifically related to children with learning disabilities. There's a high incidence of um, sensory processing problems and motor planning problems with children with, um, uh, with, sensory process with learning disabilities. So it's very common to see the two together. OK. All right. That ends our Q&A session. Leslie, thank you very much. I'm now going to turn uh, the session back over to Kelly for a wrap-up. OK. Thank you for joining our webinar on TS and difficulty with sensory processing and integration. Um, there is an exit survey which should show on your screen as you exit the webinar. Please fill out the evaluation. Um, the discussion board will be open tomorrow and ha be available for the next seven days on the NJCTS website for any additional questions that weren't answered during tonight's presentation. That website is www.njcts.org. Also, an archived recording of tonight's webinar will be posted to the site shortly. Our next presentation, Brain Balance and its Relationship to Movement and Behavior, will be presented by Dr. Vincent Kieschlin and is scheduled for August 25, 2010. Be looking for an invitation to this webinar. This ends tonight's webinar. Thank you, Leslie, for your presentation, and thank you, everyone, for attending.